Uh, please join me in welcoming today Dr. Peter Wicks. Hello, everyone. Today, I plan to talk to you about connections I see between two remarkable works. The first is Alistair McIntyre's masterpiece, After Virtue, published in 1981, which was an instant sensation. It was reviewed widely, not only within philosophy, but within the larger intellectual organs of opinion, and became something of a precursor to a great deal of renewed interest in directions in ethics that had been ignored for a long time. Although it's worth noting that one of McIntyre's important precursors in this was Elizabeth Anscombe, whose 1958 paper, Modern Moral Philosophy, is one of his inspirations. I want to connect After Virtue and McIntyre's attempt to show that Aristotle, contrary to what is widely believed, provides a viable way of thinking about ethics in the modern world with the film Groundhog Day. Released in 1993, the film was a success, although not a tremendous hit, and it was reviewed positively, although a number of critics compared it unfavorably with some of the successful comedies for which Bill Murray was at that time uh, best known. What's quite extraordinary is in the subsequent years, Groundhog Day has had a tremendous resonance with a wide variety of viewers. It was a very television-friendly film and was repeated many times. And many people don't just love the film, but have come to believe it has something substantial and profound to say about ethics and the human condition. Nonetheless, some of the interpretations which have been offered to me don't seem very compelling and don't seem a successful articulation that it would explain quite why the film's had the resonance it has. So you can think about what I'm doing in one of two ways. Um, I'm using the film Groundhog Day to shed light on and illustrate some of the central ideas in McIntyre's work, but I'm also suggesting that McIntyre's philosophy can help us to understand what people are responding to in Groundhog Day in a more successful way than many of the other interpretations that have been offered. After Virtue is an attempt to provide both a diagnosis and a prescription, an attempt to understand what ails the moral discourse of the modern world, and also to show a way forward, drawing on the inspiration of Aristotle and his particular conception of the good life. I'm going to be mainly concerned with the second positive part of that project, the way McIntyre tries to reconstitute an Aristotelian approach to ethics. But it'll be worth briefly saying something about the problem as he sees it. And so the first quotation on your handout refers to a problem that McIntyre describes as the incommensurability of modern moral debates. This is a term he appropriates from the philosophy of science. And in this context, he uses incommensurability to mean the phenomenon where we encounter arguments that go all the way down to first principles, between which there seems to be no obviously rational way to find a resolution. So it's not just that on a variety of moral topics, we seem to be subject to interminable and heated moral disputes, but those disputes go all the way down to more general and deep-seated differences in our conception of the good life and the role of morality in human affairs. In much of the first half of the book, McIntyre attempts to offer a genealogy that traces the origin of this current state of moral disorder and tries to argue this isn't the permanent state of human affairs, but rather the result of a number of uh, quite distinct historical episodes which have brought us to the place where we are. And then he turns to try to make the case that while people had understandable reasons to suppose Aristotle's ethics was no longer viable in the modern world, no longer compatible with a modern scientific worldview, it is nonetheless possible to salvage what is most essential in Aristotle's view in a way that is acceptable uh, to the modern mind. But one point I think is not well understood enough about McIntyre 
is that he isn't suggesting if somebody were to enter one of the interminable debates of modern morality, burnishing Aristotle's revamped theory of ethics, they would win the day in a regular moral argument. Presented as an argument in the various uh, forums of moral dispute, Aristotle's theory will be just that, one more theory, incommensurable with its rivals and not obviously able to prevail over them. So in addition to showing you the key concepts of the Aristotelianism, I intend to illustrate the way in which it's motivated and the way in which he thinks somebody who doesn't already accept the Aristotelian perspective might come to hold it in a reasonable way. Um, but before that, maybe a few words about Groundhog Day and some rival interpretations which are available. In 2003, the Museum of Modern Art in New York held a series of films of philosophical and religious significance. And many of the films in this series were the kind of obviously artistic films made by auteur directors that one might expect to see in a film series at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. But Groundhog Day was also on the billing, and according to a New York Times article written uh, shortly afterwards, this was the film where there was the most dispute about who would get to write the catalog entry, because more people wanted to write about it than anything else. And in that same New York Times article, a number of academics are quoted offering rival interpretations of the film. I'll mention just two. The first comes from Angela Zito, who has taught for many years at NYU, classes on Buddhism that make use of the film. And she can, seeks to connect it up with the Mahayana tradition of Buddhism. In Mahayana, nobody ever imagines that they're going to escape samsara until everyone else does. That is why you have bodhisattvas who reach the brink of nirvana and stop and come back and save the rest of us. Bill Murray is the bodhisattva. He's not going to abandon the world. On the contrary, he is released back into the world to save it. Now, I think there are a number of problems with this interpretation, but in the interest of time, I'll just mention one, which is none of those things happen. <laughs> none of the events of the film remotely correspond to the narrative as she's just described it. In the film, Bill Murray is the only one who is stuck repeating the cycle of Groundhog Day. He is the only one who has this problem. Furthermore, at no point does he make a cho choice either to stay within that cycle of repetition or to leave it. He doesn't know why it happens, and he doesn't even know why it stops happening. So while there is, of course, a sudden echo between the idea of samsara, this cycle of uh, eternal reincarnation, and Bill Murray's predicament, I don't think this goes very far, and certainly I don't think it goes very far in the way that Zito suggests. A second interpretation uh, by Michael Bronsky of Dartmouth. The groundhog is clearly the resurrected Christ. Um, at this point, I should probably say, um, for those of you who aren't academics, beware of academics using the word clearly. <laughs> it's usually a placeholder where evidence and argument should be. The groundhog is clearly the resurrected Christ the ever hopeful renewal of life at springtime, at a time of pagan Christian holidays. And when I say that the groundhog is Jesus, I say that with great respect. Um, well, I don't suppose that he meant to be disrespectful. I certainly wouldn't accuse him of that. But this interpretation also doesn't seem to me to go anywhere. One reason to think that is we could, for the sake of argument, grant him the claim make the identification. Suppose the groundhog does represent Jesus. Well, does anything that happens in the film make more sense now than it did before you made that identification? I don't see so. I don't think it does. I don't see any way in which that unlocks the meaning of the film or even begins to explain why the film's had such extraordinary resonance. Now, in offering an Aristotelian interpretation of the film, I want to be clear that I'm not suggesting that there aren't other fruitful ways in which the film could be read. And I also want to be clear that I'm not suggesting that at any point any of the key filmmakers, either the director or the writer, 
self-consciously had the thought that they wanted to make a film that illustrated Aristotelian ethics. Nonetheless, I think they did very clearly make a film and intend to make a film that's interested in its central character's moral transformation. And I think that the way they depict that transformation, whether they realize it or not, is usefully illuminated and usefully illustrates the Aristotelian picture of how we make moral progress. Okay. And then finally, by way of preliminaries, I want to sketch out the way in which McIntyre attempts to rebuild an Aristotelian understanding of ethics. If you've read Aristotle but not McIntyre, some of the terminology and categories won't be immediately familiar. I think that while it's clearly true that after virtue helped to set up the tremendous surge of interest in what became known as virtue ethics in the 1990s and early 2000s, it's rather unhelpful to think of McIntyre primarily as an early figure and a leading influence on the virtue ethics movement, partly because I think virtue ethics as a label is applied to such a broad range of theories that many of them really have very little connection with his project. I think it's more useful to think of him as somebody who is reconstituting a robust and full-blooded Aristotelianism. But nonetheless, he's doing it in unfamiliar categories. He talks about a type of activity, which he dubs practices, that have a particularly crucial role in human life. These are activities which are intrinsically fulfilling and activities where we first begin to appreciate the need for virtues if we are to live well. He talks about community and the way we are to understand our relationship to the community and the relationship between our good as individuals and the good of the social units of which we're a part. And finally, he talks about the unity of a human life being constituted in narrative by having a certain kind of narrative shape. I'll say more about the, all of these as we go along discussing the film. But the point I want to highlight here is that McIntyre thinks we won't be able to understand virtue, why some qualities of character are virtues and others are not, until we can see the role that virtue plays at each of these levels of human life, each with their own goods, which we can't achieve without the virtues. Okay, well, now to Groundhog Day. Groundhog Day obviously deals with a fantastical, an impossible scenario. But the response to the film suggests that nonetheless there is something recognizable about the situation Phil Connors finds himself in. And the film, I think, works very hard to draw attention to the ways in which, while we may not have ever repeated the exact same day, something about his situation is all too familiar. In an early scene, as it's beginning to sink in what's happening to him, repeating the same day again and again, he goes to a bar in a bowling alley and gets drunk with a couple of locals. And he says to them, what would you do if you were stuck in the same place and every day was exactly the same and nothing you did mattered? To which one of them, Ralph, replies, well, that about sums it up for me. <laughs> so his problem isn't Phil Connor's problem, but Phil Connor's problem is a fantastically exaggerated version of a problem that he recognizes. And in fact, already before Phil goes to Punxsutawney and starts repeating the same day, we see that his life has already been stuck in a rut. You must really enjoy it, says the news anchor. This is your third year in a row, isn't it, Phil? Now, of course, it's already become clear to us, the audience, he hates going to Punxsutawney. He resents this. He wishes he were doing something else, something more glamorous, something more interesting. But being on television, he has to put on a fake smile and through gritted teeth say four. Four. So this is not a problem we've encountered, but a problem that we do recognize. 
we see something of Phil's attitude to life and his attitude to morality in how he responds to his situation after he overcomes the initial shock. That same evening where he gets drunk at the bowling alley, he and the other two locals go for a joyride. And he says to them, let me ask you guys a question. What if there were no tomorrow? And what's interesting about this is that they get the point of the question immediately. There's no hesitation, no tomorrow. That would mean there'd be no consequences. There'd be no hangovers. We could do whatever we wanted. And Phil continues, that's true. We could do whatever we want. It's the same thing your whole life. Clean up your room, stand up straight, pick up your feet, take it like a man, be nice to your sister, don't mix beer and wine ever, don't drive on the railroad tracks. Now, Phil here is not expressing the view that there's no reason to be moral. He does think there's a reason to be moral. But the reason is purely to do with the bad consequences that will follow if he isn't. And now he finds himself in the situation where nothing that he does has any consequences that outlast the day. Suddenly that reason doesn't apply anymore. So we see something about how he's always thought about morality and the rules he's expected to follow from the way he responds to this new situation. Phil is, in McIntyre's terminology, an aesthete. He's somebody for whom life is about having a good time. And as befits an aesthete, once he comes to the conclusion that he's stuck repeating Groundhog Day in Punxsutawney again and again and again. He decides to make the best he can of the situation and turns Punxsutawney into his personal playground. He exploits his knowledge of the events of the day to learn how to steal money. He learns about the various residents of Punxsutawney and uses this knowledge to get his way, including seducing a local. And this speaks to who he always was. Somebody who always would have done this if he thought he could get away with it. McIntyre writes in After Virtue that aesthetes are those who see in the social world nothing but a meeting place for individual wills, each with its own set of attitudes and preferences, and who understand the world solely as an arena for the achievement of their own satisfaction who interpret reality as a series of opportunities for their enjoyment and for whom the last enemy is boredom. And McIntyre argues that there is a quite long tradition of literary and philosophical writers who have been very interested in this character type, sometimes with the suggestion that there are features of the modern world that make such characters especially prominent within it. Now, we may be inclined to judge the aesthete harshly. And indeed, Rita does. Um, she compares him to the wretch of the Sir Walter Scott poem. But the main thing to focus on here is how the aesthete isn't well positioned to understand the problem with their way of life. And the moral condemnation that they receive strikes them often as high-handed moralizing from people who don't know how to loosen up and have a good time. As an aesthete, Phil has a particular take on what the problem is with being stuck in Punxsutawney on February 2nd, repeating the same day again and again and again. This dialogue also comes from that same scene at the bar in the bowling alley. I was in the Virgin Islands once. I met a girl. We ate lobster and drank pina coladas. At sunset, we made love like sea otters. That was a pretty good day. Why couldn't I get that day over and over and over? So the problem isn't repeating the same day again and again and again. The problem is having to do that stuck in this dumb town of Punxsutawney with these dumb people with their dumb traditions. People are idiots, he says early on, and we believe that he believes it. Now, what's interesting about the next part of the film is we see Phil Connors gradually learn 
that it is possible for him, under these circumstances, to have his kind of a good time. He can't get to the Virgin Islands, but he can play around, he can seduce women, he can play games, he can have fun. Rita tries to point out the problem with his way of life. She doesn't fully understand his situation, and he certainly doesn't fully understand what she's saying. She quotes Sir Walter Scott, the wretch consented all in self, living shall forfeit fair renown, and doubly dying shall go down to the vile dust from whence he sprung, unwept, unhonored, and unsung. And he scoffs. And I think that's plausible. That's a plausible reaction to what she's saying. If he saw the point, he wouldn't be Phil Connors as we've met him. Very gradually, he's going to learn the point that she's making. But it's characteristic of the aesthete that they can't be argued out of their position because their position doesn't recognize any higher values to which the argument might appeal. So Phil continues to have his kind of a good time in Punxsutawney, and it gradually dawns on him he can do whatever he wants. He can sleep with this woman again and again and again. Seduction is, in a way, the paradigmatic activity of the aesthete because it's driven by excitement, the thrill of the chase. And this is also why it represents the trouble for the aesthete because they're constantly threatened by the last enemy, boredom. And it's at the point where he sees he can have fun of his kind of good time, apparently forever and ever, that he tries to take his own life, a series of elaborate suicide attempts. He drops the toaster in the bar. I don't think he fully understands why. I don't think he fully appreciates what's so unsatisfying about what, in the abstract, might have sounded like he would enjoy it. But he does discover there is something wretched about the life that he's living. When he discovers that not even death can save him from the cycle of repetition, a few interesting things happen. He tries to forge new connections with both Rita and other people in Punxsutawney. And he starts to play the piano. Playing the piano is a good example of the kind of activity that McIntyre dubs a practice in After Virtue. Um, the definition of a practice is notoriously long and complex, but it's that way for a reason. McIntyre thinks that there are activities that share a variety of features that have an important role in our life and moral development. So if you excuse me, I'll quote the entire definition, which you can also see on your handout. A practice is a coherent and complex form of socially established cooperative human activity through which goods internal to that form of activity are realized in the course of trying to achieve those standards of excellence which are appropriate to and partially definitive of that form of activity, with the result that human powers to achieve excellence and human conceptions of the ends and goods involved are systematically extended. We're not given a clear explanation of why it occurs to Phil to do this. A few possibilities suggest themselves, and they're not mutually exclusive. He seems by this point to have given up on the idea of seducing Rita, but he's still trying to make a connection with her. And she mentioned earlier in the film that her ideal man would, amongst other things, play a musical instrument. That may be part of the motivation. Another possibility is that reconciled to the idea he's got eternity, he has to find something to do with his time. And one of the distinctive features of practices is they have a sort of open-endedness where there is an indefinite possibility 
to extend one's achievements. However good you get at the piano, it's never the case that you've got as good as it's possible for anyone to get. There's always room to strive. And if you have eternity and want to find something to do, activities which are like that may seem like uh, a promising avenue to channel one's energies. But why ever he does it to begin with, as we see him develop his piano playing skills, we also see him develop a new relationship to the people of Punxsutawney. This, from McIntyre's perspective, shouldn't surprise us. It shouldn't be at all remarkable that taking part in the practice may help to unsettle many of the assumptions that have been built into Phil's aesthetic way of life. Partly because practices are activities where the goods are characteristically non-competitive and indeed shared. The enjoyment that comes from an excellent musical performance isn't such that my enjoyment takes away from yours or vice versa. On the contrary, the achievement of one person is often a good that benefits other members of the practice as well. So practices have their own form of community that they create, centered on the goods, the things that make the activity worth doing in the first place. There's another reason why developing within a practice would unsettle the aesthetes' view of the world. By unsettling the aesthetes' view of other people, for a pure aesthete, other people are purely an opportunity or an obstacle to one's enjoyment. Somebody who might help you have a good time or get in the way of that goal. You can't learn from people who you see in those terms. And the point that McIntyre stresses when he introduces the notion of a practice is we have to attend to how we learn these activities. He says, it belongs to the concept of a practice as I have outlined it, that its goods can only be achieved by subordinating ourselves within the practice in our relationship to other practitioners. We have to learn to recognize what is due to whom. We have to be prepared to take whatever self-endangering risks are demanded along the way. And we have to listen carefully to what we are told about our own inadequacies and to reply with the same carefulness for the facts. That involves taking other people seriously in a way that a pure aesthete would be incapable of. And I think that in coming to see a teacher in those ways, one might naturally have the thought that whether other people you've treated as instrumental in the past might be worth taking more seriously. In the final act of the film, we see the routine that Phil has gradually developed. A routine that begins with a virtuoso performance at the Groundhog Day Festival, he was so contemptuous of at the beginning of the film, and then is filled with errands as he runs around Punxsutawney helping the people of Punxsutawney in ways that only he can, because only he's fully aware of what their needs will be on this day. Standing here among the people of Punxsutawney and basking in the warmth of their hearts and hearts, I couldn't imagine a better fate than a long and lustrous winter. This is how far he's come. Not just the eloquence, but the sincerity. He really believes this. He's come to see something he couldn't see before. In the evening festivities, there's a dance in the town hall, and we see him playing the keyboard as part of a band, using the skills he's learned in his practice. Throughout the film, it's bothered Phil tremendously that the groundhog, who stands for everything that's most hokey and silly about this town, shares his name, Punxsutawney Phil. It's salt in the wound. By the time we see him playing as part of a band in the Groundhog Day festivities, we see a Phil Connors who deserves to be called Punks the Tawny Phil. A Phil Connors who's come to understand that his good is tied together with the good of these people, 
who has become the focus of their enjoyment, just as his rodent namesake was the focus of their enjoyment that morning, and who likes playing that role. That's the transformation that's accomplished. And it was accomplished not by argument, but by bitter experience. He wasn't a wicked man at the start of the film, and he isn't a saint at the end of it. But he's been through a profound moral transformation. I would like to suggest that Groundhog Day is the story of somebody who becomes good out of desperation, because he's tried everything else. After the dance, he talks to Rita. No matter what happens tomorrow for the rest of my life, I'm happy now because I love you. Notice what he doesn't say. He doesn't say, I'm happy now because finally I'm someone that you can love. He says, I'm happy now because I love you. No longer consented all in self, he's been liberated from the burden of his self-absorption. He's finally got the point that he scoffed at when Rita made it in what for him is many thousands of days ago, but for her is just that morning. So let me ask you guys a question. What if there were no tomorrow? The film gives us a fake out. After this extraordinary day, the radio hits six o'clock, starts to play, and we hear the same Sonny and Cher song that we've come to be irritated by to at least some small fraction of the extent that he's irritated by it. It looks like, once again, he's stuck in February the 2nd. Now, he's had a fantastic day the day before. He could do the same things again. But intuitively, I think we grasp that that wouldn't be a happy ending. Fortunately for him, it turns out that it isn't February the 2nd, it's February 3rd. The radio just played the wrong song by mistake. Why is that a happy ending? Because it holds out the prospect of a real happy ending. Now that time has moved on, it's possible for Phil to incorporate what he's learned into a real human life. One of the things he's learned is that a life is not a succession of days. A year is not 365 days. A year is 365 days long. There's been something shapeless about his existence with no seasons, with no ability to impact the lives of others in a way that will last longer than the day. So it's only now that time has moved on, Phil is confronted by the possibility of weaving his life in with the lives of others and making himself part of their story just as they have become part of his. The notion of narrative unity, I think, is one of the hardest concepts to grasp in After Virtue. But one way I think we can get some purchase on the idea is by contemplating a situation in which the possibility of achieving such unity is dramatically foreclosed, which is exactly the position that Phil has been in. So I'll finish by... Um, quoting a notoriously difficult part of McIntyre's constructive approach in After Virtue, where he says the good life for man is the life spent in seeking for the good life for man, and the virtues necessary for the seeking are those which will enable us to understand what more and what else the good life for man is. When people get to this point in the book, they often feel very frustrated this feels rather anticlimactic. It can even seem like there's something circular here. This almost reads like a kind of joke. The good life is seeking the good life. How could that be right? 
But I think this involves a misunderstanding of the kind of seeking we're talking about. Seeking here doesn't refer to intellectual speculation. The good life isn't asking the question, what is the good life? It's striving to achieve the good life as best we understand it, a striving in the course of which we can, though it's far from guaranteed, gradually improve and develop our understanding of what a successful human life would be. That's the kind of quest he's talking about, and that's the kind of quest Phil is finally free to pursue on February 3rd. So let me close by saying one of the ways in which McIntyre is more Aristotelian than many other theorists who are often grouped together under this elastic and expansive virtue ethics label. It's about how we come to understand ethics. Not by argument. Arguments have a role, but they come in quite late in the process, in the articulation and defense of things that we come to understand in the course of our practical lives. That's what Aristotelians mean when they describe their philosophy as the philosophy of common sense. Not that its results and conclusions are in any sense obvious, self-evident, or easily come by, but that they are continuously rediscovered in the course of our practical lives, in the course of our quest for the good life for man. Thank you very much. <laughs>